He sent me a letter and asked me if I would read this to both you and the entire congregation. John Watson says, The first memory of my friend Fred was when he was in Bible college and I was still a high school kid. Then he married one of our temple girls, Carol Louise Westbrook. That showed his smarts as, at a young age. Some of you know John's humor here. During our ministry years, Fred was always a tower of strength to the local church, wherever he pastored, to the district in which he served, to the national church at large, to young and struggling pastors, as well as to missionaries around the world. His administrative gifts were always an advantage. Anywhere he labored and ministered, a gr he was a great gift to the church. When Roy Hicks Jr. was Foursquare Missions Director, he asked Fred and Carol to assume the position of missionaries in Hong Kong. Fred was, Fred was in for a surprise to learn that a pastor in our movement had, had more opportunity for, for input than those working in the central office. However, Fred put his administrative gift to work in that part of the world. He sold the Hong Kong condo prior to the 1997 takeover of the Chinese government. Taking those funds, he purchased a condo in Singapore, which later would be used for living quarters for others over the, uh, for the oversight of Foursquare missions and in Asia and in South Pacific. One of the things I would love uh, I would love to have been in attendance when, uh, when in West Texas, Fred went into the Hong Kong hardware store to purchase a rat trap. When the, <laughs> when, when the Chinese merchant finally understood that Fred wanted to catch a rat, he gave Fred a can with some liquid in it. Fred told the uh, merchant that he knew a rat trap, and this was not one. As in many parts of the world, to kill a rodent, you put food on a cardboard and pour this liquid in a circle around the food. The rat goes to the food and the liquid is like glue and the rat cannot move. Then you can do whatever you want to with the rat. In our latter years, Fred and Carol, uh, along with Bonnie and myself, traveled to several parts of the world together. We were able to tour the Baltic uh, nations on one trip and the United Kingdom on another. One tour we took together uh, was in the lake country of Italy, in Switzerland and, Aus and Austria. It was on this trip that I played my last round of golf. Fred and I played 18 holes in the Australian Alps. Great scenery, great memory, great fellowship. Thanks, my friend. You allowed me special times on those, those and other trips. It was my extreme pleasure to have this time with you and Carol. While Bonnie and I uh, lived in Singapore, Fred and Carol came several times to, the south, to, to Southeast Asia for many times of ministry in Malaysia, Thailand, and Cambodia. Faithful laborers. If I could speak to Fred today, I would say, look in your rearview mirror. I'm coming right after you, my brother. In the meantime, I will rejoice in Christ, our Redeemer, and be thankful for our time of ministering together, uh, my fellow servant, John Watson. At this time, yes, go ahead. Thank you, John. At this time, um, we're going to have some music. It's congregational singing, I believe, too, huh? You, they may want to join you, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you sure can. We're going to sing a, a medley of hymns that um, were special to Dad. I don't know how many of you might remember at Calvary that he loved the word redeemed. He loved that word. That um, means that through Christ's death on the cross, he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And um, that was great, a great comfort and a great blessing to him. The latter few songs that we're going to sing were especially dear to Daddy in his final days. 
um, he would sing these and uh, just tear string down his face because it meant so much to him. Would you stand and sing with us? And I need you to sing really loud because this wind is making a mess of my voice. Redeemed how I love to proclaim Well, it is well with my soul. 
My sin, oh, the bliss. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin. going to come and talk. <laughs> I'm the one that planned this. <laughs> I should know what's next. It's the it's the allergies, like she said. <laughs> So um, I prepared a few words, and uh, bear with me as I read them. Um, making eye contact with most of you is probably going to produce some tears, so forgive me if I'm focused. Uh, so many of you here know that um, I get my height from my father. <laughs> okay, okay. I get my height from granddad. Um, but that's not the only thing that granddad passed along. I have the beautiful Dawson nose. <laughs> no, no, in serious, there's a bunch of gifts, and we'll get to them. Uh, so, my granddad, Fred Harvester Dawson. Harvester. And many of you already know this, but the name Harvester was a heavy favorite in the running for my name. I've been told that my father's middle name and my grandfather's middle name were quite an appetizing combination. You ready? Monfort Harvester Stein. <laughs> Has quite the pretentious hipster ring to it, huh? How on earth I managed to dodge that bullet. So I'd like to publicly use this platform to thank the Lord for his intervention. Um, there's many pages that I could fill with stories about Granddad. However, I'd like to share a few of my favorite intimate moments with you today. As you've already heard, Granddad was a little bit competitive. <laughs> Some of my, I don't even know why I got choked up there. Some of my first memories of Granddad are playing games. In our family, it was quite the feat to be Granddad at anything. And as you can imagine, this became the goal for the three of us anytime we sat down to play games. And now, some people in life would call that a badge of honor to have your grandkids always gunning for you. But if Granddad felt that way, he never let us know. <laughs> um, granddad's favorite expression when he was disgusted with how the game was going, and probably many other things in life, was all together now, good night. <laughs> So I'm sure many of you can relate, and you've heard that. Um, great, yeah, sorry, dude. Same granddad. Um, growing up, uh, I had the privilege to spend Tuesday evenings with Nana and granddad when mom and dad would host Bible study. Um, those nights were filled with swimming, 
pick up sticks, happy meals, hot tubs, and then donuts every Wednesday morning on the way to church and preschool. <laughs> Donna shakes her head. Yep. Um, it was during these nights uh, that I learned a lot from Nana and Granddad, it's specifically about respect for my elders. And uh, I'll be forever grateful for those lessons and memories. Um, when, uh, when I was nine, Nan and Granddad had told us grandkids that they were going to take us on a trip. And I think maybe you guys were a little bit older, but I was nine. And Nana and Granddad took me to Mount Rushmore and the surrounding states. And the hotel near Mount Rushmore where we stayed had a massive indoor pool and this giant water slide. And as you can imagine, every nine-year-old's dream. Well, <laughs> poor Granddad, at this point in life, was 59 years old. And he was up and down that water slide with me the entire day. And I, who knows how many times we went up and down. But um, the memory I have <laughs> of going up and down that water slide with Granddad, yeah, that's a, a memory of sacrifice. And <laughs> that, that, that was, that's Granddad. Um, a little bit older, I was 12 or 13 when uh, I took the trip that changed my life, and it would, sh you know, come to shape my global perspective. Nana and Granddad met Mom and I in the Philippines as they spoke at the commencement ceremonies at a handful of Bible college graduations. And, oh, man, I cannot adequately, adequately express the impact this trip has had on me. To this day, I'm forever changed. Uh, my heart was softened to see people who are so different than myself through a lens of love. <laughs> Sorry. The gratitude I have for the life I was given is a direct result of this trip. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, Granddad, for this life-altering gift. <laughs> it was also on this trip where I learned it didn't matter where we play cards. Granddad is always a competitor. And while we sat in the Manila airport playing skip bow, <laughs> mom was off to the side reading, and Nana and I were able to elicit a handful of passionate good nights <laughs> from granddad. So much so that mom claimed she was embarrassed and got up and left us. <laughs> Another lesson came later in life when granddad taught me how to fillet a fish up at the family cabin in Duck Creek, Utah. Uh, anyone who knew Granddad certainly knew he loved to fish. And for me, what an honor and a privilege to have been taught by my Granddad, who had fished all over the world and had caught countless fish. Uh, back in February, Nana and Granddad celebrated their 90th wedding anniversary. Uh, 70th, sorry. <laughs> he, he's, he's 90 years old. I don't know how that's possible, but... <laughs> What an incredible example of love they set for us. When we asked him what the secret to a successful marriage is, he replied, well, just keep on breathing. <laughs> S sound wisdom. Uh, Granddad's love for Nana was evident every single day and only rivaled by his love for Jesus. Uh, what a blessing. What a blessing it was to be able to spend that final week with Granddad. He made it to his 90th birthday, and we were all able to sing happy birthday to him. And even in the difficult moments of that last week, when we would say, I love you, Granddad, he would respond with his go-to phrase of, I know you do, and you know I love you. I have wonderful memories of our family uh, gathered around the dinner table, the card table, and of course, in front of the TV watching the Dallas Cowboys. What an incredible legacy Granddad has left for us. Granddad planted seeds of love all throughout our lives. Love for sports, Cowboys. Love for card and board games. Love for traveling and tasting foreign foods. A love for fishing, a love for our family. A love for Nana. A love for the scriptures and love for fellowship with people from every walk of life, as well as fellowship with Jesus. 
And granddad's love for Christ and a heart of ser servitude has been well documented here today. And it's a blessing to me when I think about the number of lives granddad has touched throughout his life's work. Holy smokes, man. The impact he has left on my life is still being written, and I know it will continue into eternity. My granddad was faithful at a young age. Excuse me. My granddad was faithful at a young age with what he was given and subsequently remained faithful with the great many blessings bestowed on him later in life. When he took his last breath, I have no doubt he was greeted with a, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, beautifully said, Joshua. <laughs> I don't know how I can top that, but I'll give it a shot. Um, everyone's been impacted by my granddad in some way, in some form. So kind of like Josh, um, but a little more unique, I'm the only granddaughter. So I get a little bit of a different perspective and different experience that I'd like to share with you today. Um, I'm going to share two memories and then um, some stuff that he has passed down to me and, and my family. Um, the first memory that I have, not my very first, but one that stands out to me is when I was um, five or six, our house had gotten broken into while we were at church on a Wednesday night. And when we got there um, to the house, it was just me and my mom. And the person had already gone, but... I was like, I am not going in that house until granddad gets here. I am not going in. I need the big man. And I waited until he came in to tell us that it was going to be okay. I found such great security. He was so tall and a protector, and I really felt that from him, um, even at that young age. The second memory that I um, cherish is everyone knows he loves to play cards, and um, I conjured up um, a scheme to have us track who the winner was, because I'm very competitive myself. And so I also made sure I was never on granddad's team because I had to beat him. Um, but the scheme was if uh, we were gonna track how many times we won and whoever made it to 10 had uh, the other two, because it was me, Nana, and granddad, the other two who lost had to buy that person ice cream. And um, I never had to buy ice cream. <laughs> they just took me to get ice cream. <laughs> but he was very willing to play any time, all the time, and um, that has brought so much uh, joy to all of our lives because we all participated in that, and it really grew our family close to one another. Um, the few things that I wanted to um, say that he had passed down um, to me and my family are... Um, when um, the marriage that he had with my Nana, how can you compare it? it? It's so amazing, and the two shall become one was is so much, you represent it so well, because everything is Nana and Granddad. So while we say Granddad, Granddad, I also want to honor you, Nana, because you two were so on the same page in everything you did, and we all felt that. So um, some things that uh, my granddad and Nana taught me um, is how important it is to tithe. Being a giving, they are the most giving people. I'm sure everyone has a story of how they particularly gave, whether it was time or money, but also how important it is to give your first fruits to God. And I truly believe our family is so blessed because of the dedic the continual tithe we have all given and, and the blessing that follows that. And I just, if you're not tithing, uh, this isn't a tithe message, but there is a blessing with it. So, so thank you for teaching us um, to be givers in all that we do. Um, the second one is how much he loved to travel, and I really love to travel. In fact, any time it's getting th four or five months, I'm like, I got to go somewhere. 
I got to get out of here. And I get that from my nana and my granddad. And even my son, Kai, is a lover of travel. He's the same way. I got to get out of here. We got to go somewhere. So um, I really appreciate, again, what a great, great way you put it, the perspective that traveling gives to see how other people live and, and loving them through all circumstances. And we thank you for that, um, Granddad. Our family's very unique. I um, never knew this go growing up. I thought we were a normal family. I thought we, every family, spent as much time together as we do, and we love each other as much as we do. And I'm so grateful for the family I was born into and the, the heritage I have received from my granddad and my nana. We have truly received a generational blessing. And I, I really thank you for, for that. Um, they also took me on a trip, my last thing, they um, also took me on a trip, and um, I had to do something every single day because I'm, I'm a busybody. So they took me to many different places, and um, I remember this one particular, we were in Catalina, and I wanted to go in the water, and the water was very, very cold. And... I made them, or I made my nana get, get in with me, and I said, well, this is very cold. And granddad said, you're staying in that water. <laughs> you are going to swim. <laughs> and we swam. <laughs> well, what do you say about a legend? There's so many great memories that uh, we all have with him. He helped to instill a lot of different things into me, and so I want to share a couple of what those things were. The first one, much like my cousin and my brother's travel, you can see how much they love to travel when you look at those pictures, and they made sure to pass that love down to all three of us grandkids. I remember when uh, I was 12 when they took me to Yellowstone, and I have a lot of special memories that were made on that trip. Uh, the one that comes to mind the most is, you know, Yellowstone, there's buffalo, and granddad and I are getting out as close as we can to those things taking pictures, and here's Nana back, get back here, <laughs> screaming, going up to their cabin to go fishing. I had just graduated high school and uh, went on to Nav Navajo Lake, rented a little metal boat. Granted, I got out in the middle, thunderstorms coming in, and I'm casting out, like I'm catching a fish. We finally got out here, and my granddad stopped fooling around and helped me get this boat back to the dock. <laughs> if you've uh, ever seen him animated, you can imagine how animated he was right there. Uh, they took me to Cambodia for my first missions trip. I think they were being intentional to plant the bug into me, and the hook worked. Uh, definitely have a heart for missions, and uh, I love that he would do crazy things with me, like eating fried tarantula. You guys saw the picture. It was fried tarantula he was eating. He would do that. I mean, he loved hanging out with his grandkids, and he was willing to do whatever we wanted. It was awesome. One of the things that I remember, it's the last thing we got to do as a family, was go on that cruise to Alaska. We were all so concerned of how was Granddad going to do. He crushed it. He did so good. And we got to have such a special time with him. And we saw so many pictures were from that cruise. He instilled things like the love of games. Many of you guys know about the great softball or volleyball stories that exist. Uh, some of you guys have been blessed or cursed, depending upon, to be his partner in a game of hand and foot. I didn't realize Lindsay's over here cheating, because apparently that's must have been what she was doing. We were playing rock, paper, scissors to see who the partner was with Grendad, with Nana, and who had to be with Grendad. I lost a lot. But it worked out. My gr <laughs> Grendad was really, really smart. And he passed that analytical brain on to my aunt, my mom, and to all three of us. And I figured him out pretty quick. I learned to play like him. And the two of us became a pretty good pairing. But if I messed up every once in a while, there would be a, why would you do that? <laughs> or what are you doing? Or our favorite, good night. Uh, it was that analytical thinking that got Josh and I playing Lord of the Rings with him. Lord of the Rings Brisk, and he loved playing that with us, and we equally enjoyed playing it with him. When I was at Bible college and 
my Nana and Granddad were down in Southern California on the weekends. Poor Nana had to suffer through Granddad and I playing it every Saturday morning for hours. You guys may not know this, but Granddad could talk trash. And he, <laughs> and he was pretty good at it. He instilled love for family. As I was putting together this video, there's a constant look that Granddad has on his face, and it's that love for his family. So many pictures are of him just looking at you, Nana, with those eyes gazing at you. He loved his family, and not just the immediate group of his kids and his grandkids, uh, and even great-grandkids, but he loved his siblings and their kids, his nieces and nephews. Family was the glue that bonded everyone together. And towards the end, one of my favorite things was to watch my granddad as he was staring at my youngest, Bethany. He would just be mesmerized by whatever playing, dancing she was doing and have this awesome grin from cheek to cheek just watching her. It was the best look. He instilled this love of ministry. And while it's true that his ministry journey took him all over the world and, yes, some awesome and incredible places like Hong Kong and Singapore and even the bright lights of Las Vegas, a lot of the places that he said yes to were hard places. I won't get into that, but I've heard the stories, and it wasn't always the bright lights. But he always was willing to say yes. What a legacy he modeled for us to follow, to say yes. When they were at Calvary, they trained and released multiple leaders to go pastor. He didn't hold on to his leaders. He released them. He sent them. The Shinkies, the Days, the Stevens, and I know there were so many others that went on to pastor from Calvary. What a legacy. And what a model of leadership. When I was the junior high youth pastor at Solid Rock, Calvary, whatever name, I was 18. He took me to lunch every Saturday afternoon at Applebee's on Nellis. And I, we could have had our own booth and waitress come with our food. We went every Saturday. We basically had it. And he would answer all of my questions. Oh, granted, I'm going through this with these kids this week. What do I do? And he'd tell me stories, he'd give me his advice. He'd encourage me. He was my licensing coach and my ministry mentor. And what's amazing to me is, as special as he was to me in all of those things, and he helped to instill those different memories, I know that he did that for so many people. And that's how special and how awesome he was. He had that ability to connect with anyone and make them feel special. And I'll end with this. I think that's something that I know I want to strive to do better and to be better at, and I think we all can. This would be about the time Dad would take his watch off and you'd think he was almost done speaking. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, Um, the kids, hi we, I didn't know what they were going to say, and they highlighted on some things that I just wanted to say um, before I sing. First, I want to thank Pastor Greg and Ruth and all of the Northgate people for this wonderful, wonderful time that you've allowed us to have to celebrate Dad. We're very grateful, and we thank you. Um, I want to especially thank our pastors from Texas, Ben and Crystal. Wave your hands. They have been mom and dad's pastors for the last seven years. And the last week of dad's life, they flew out from Texas to Phoenix to be with the family and to see dad and to love mom and all of us. And, uh, and then to come a few weeks later here, we're, we're honored and we thank you very much for coming. Um, there's some other pastors here, and I thank you all for coming. It's awesome to see you. And then we have friends that have come long distances, and uh, we thank you so much. That's a you know big expense. I see Gabe, my other son here, and and um, sitting up front here on the front row with us is Daryl and Tanita Neal, and their family, and mom and dad, their parents, and my parents were closest friends years ago back in Texas when we were young families and I can't thank you enough for coming it means the world to us that you came and there you know I can't go on because I would miss you but Rick and thank you 
for being here. Um, Dad taught me a lot of things. He taught me how to say good night. <laughs> but probably the thing that I hold the closest and dearest to me is it my dad and my mom. And you don't ever say dad without it being mom, too. They were always a team. Is to love God's word. And they challenged the church to read the Bible through every year. And I started that in 1977, and I do it every year. And I challenge you, if Dad was here, he would say, get in the Word, read God's Word. He memorized it. Um, his mama taught him to memorize, and he memorized lots of Scripture. Um, and one thing that Alzheimer's did not do, it did not take those Scriptures that he memorized in his youth it did not take those away. And he, up until the last little bit, he could still quote the books of the Bible and uh, remember the songs. He would sing the old hymns, and he would sing the bass in the sweet by and by, by and by. Yeah. The second thing, and the kids alluded to this, is how much Dad loved and adored Mom. Um, he was so generous and caring of her, if there was a piece of jewelry that Mama wanted and he could get it for her, he delighted in giving her gifts. And um, we knew Jesus was first, Mama was second, and Sherry and Mary Lee were third. Um, but don't mess with his girls. But his girls better not mess with his wife. <laughs> there were a few times in teenage years that um, he let me know what was what. And if he was here, he would challenge you men to love your wives. Show your children to love their mother. Treat her with honor and respect. And uh, you do your children a big service when they become adults. Because Mary Lee and I looked for men to marry like our dad. He had he set such a high bar. And gentlemen, do that for your girls and for your sons so they know how to treat a lady. Um, life isn't without trouble. They had more than their fair share. We've touched on a lot of the highlights. There were a lot of difficult times. But this song, Mom and Dad Loved, and we're going to try and sing it through it all. Sing it with me if you want to, because, the, like I said, the wind's playing havoc with this voice. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every city, situation, God, the blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, oh, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I have learned to trust in God. And I've seen a lot of faces There have been times I felt so all alone But in those lonely hours Yes, those precious lonely hours Jesus let me know That I was still his own I thank God for the mountains And I thank him for the valleys I thank him for the storms he's brought me through 
If I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in His Word could do. Through it all, through it all, oh, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I have learned to trust in God. Stand up and sing the chorus with me. Through it all, through it all, oh, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I have learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, oh, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Yes, I'm learning to depend upon God's Word. Okay, you can be seated, and I need to tell you that our time schedule has gone out the window. Merrily. I'll be quick. I do want to say again, thank you very much for coming. And we appreciate all the extensions of love, the cards, the expressions of love that you've given to us. But I will tell you the most important thing you can do is to pray, and pray especially for my mom. Like we've said, it, they've been together for 70 years, and it's hard to lose someone that you've been with for that amount of time. I did want to share just a couple of attributes of my father that impressed and influenced me. And the number one was he was disciplined. And we've talked about how he would read the Bible through every year, but he also read the Bible through several times in a year. And it's very impressive. If you've ever tried to read the Bible through, you know the discipline that it takes because there's so many things that can encroach on your time. So he was very disciplined. He used to go to the Chaparral High School track and walk around that, and he would jog around that. He was disciplined in his body. He took very, really good care of his body. When they lived in Hong Kong, he found a track close by, and he would walk that track as well. It's just amazing. They had to walk everywhere they went, but he still took time to find a track and to, to jog. Pretty amazing. Um, the next thing is my dad had a very, very tender heart. He could not go, usually a service, without tears coming down his face. And I so admired that in my father. He never apologized for having a tender heart. And uh, I, I'm so appreciative of that. My dad was very kind. Even as we had the hospice nurses coming in, it was amazing. He would always say, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for what you're doing. Just his kindness all the time, even in difficult circumstances. My dad was a wonderful provider. You heard that he, many times he had to work several jobs to, you know, supply the family needs. But um, not only was he a provider in that way, he was a provider and promoter of giving opportunities to others. And we had a great opportunity to have home Bible school groups, um, the elders he gave a lot of opportunity to. He gave my mom tremendous opportunity. He wanted her, encouraged her to speak, and he always said she was the greatest speaker in the world, and she is. She's phenomenal. Yep. <laughs> but he always made a way for her. He always opened the door for her. When Ron and I went to... Um, to Singapore to visit them. They made a way for us to go to Singapore. And there was, Malaysia was right next door, and um, my dad arranged for Ron to be able to speak in Malaysia through an interpreter to give him that experience. That wasn't something he had to do, but he made provision for that. He gave opportunity for that. 
And I want to give you some words from a song. Our Heavenly Father does that for us. God makes a way for us. There's a song from the musical, God with us, God will make a way quickly. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. And God will make a way for you. I'm very grateful for Greg Massoneri because he made a way for my parents. At the end of ministry for them, when they came back to Las Vegas, he asked them to go around to other churches and just minister to them. He knew how much wisdom and insight my parents had. And so he made a way. So Pastor Greg, I thank you so much for making a way for my mom and dad. And my daddy loved you very, very much. Good afternoon. Let me try that again. Good afternoon. <laughs> Sherry's a stinker. <laughs> that phrase that she mentioned that we are way into overtime, that was not meant for you. <laughs> it was meant for me. <laughs> you know, and the other thing I was really glad about the seating arrangements, I am deaf in my left ear. So she's going to go, I won't hear a word of it. It's great. <laughs> and, and, and I don't want, Sherry, you to feel by yourself, but uh, where, where did Josh go? He, Josh, I could not believe how much you look like your granddad right now. But I got to tell you, you know, did he never tell you the real reason why they went up to Mount Rushmore? That Dawson knows that was the only rock where a statue would work. <laughs> so I'm... Just saying. Well, it is more than an honor for me to be here. It's very humbling. Outside of my father, Joe Massonary, there's been no other pastor that has had a bigger impact and who has spoken into my life more than Fred John Deere, Harvester, whatever the middle name is. <laughs> I wish I would have known that. I, I'm telling you, that would have reaped a harvest. <laughs> um, and we're, David, um, were you the one that mentioned his fishing stories? Brother, he didn't catch as many fish as you think he caught. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, when I first, oh, and by the way, we're, Melinda, you have to know this too, and you are right, by the way. When I came to Las Vegas, Carol, your husband told me that anyone on staff at Calvary Foursquare that put one nickel into a slot machine would be terminated the next day. Am I correct? So not only did you see him playing cards, <laughs> he was at a poker table. <laughs> and just so you don't, you guys realize, it wasn't just the Bible college that taught that. Um, in fact, one of the professors that my son had in the early 2000s, he would not drive through Las Vegas. He would go around, and if he did, he would never stop for gas. Because that's the way Life Bible College viewed us. So we really haven't gotten too far up on the scale down there at the national office. So, um, and, and, and might I say, um, Carol, you um, are an amazing, amazing lady. I uh, always felt like when... Carol and Fred Dawson came to Cornerstone that 
I really had to up my game. I had to really stand up straight and make sure that all my research and exegesis was correct because the Holy Spirit was there. <laughs> and I noticed that even on some nights when I came over to service at, at Calvary Foursquare, um, and which, by the way, Fred loved to let other people know in town it's the original Calvary. Um, <laughs> just saying. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll weave that into the story later. But, in fact, Sherry only gave me 20 minutes, so I'm going to make all, all that I can in 20 minutes. Yeah, I wonder if we should have a, a everybody want to stand up and stretch a little bit, man? Um, how do you condense 90 years of life, of being a husband, a father, a grandfather, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, a missionary, a leader, a shepherd, a friend, trombone player, eh, not so much. <laughs> How do you put all of that into the context of just 20 minutes? As difficult as it may seem, I'm hoping that there will be a tool that will help us make this worth our time. I want to share from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, Doug, if I could, could I have, um, I hope this works. This is from Dinah Niemeyer, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to have to borrow somebody's, uh, some ladies, uh, if you have some uh, rouge or lipstick or some base, I'm going to need that because it's very important, and you'll understand in just a moment. Not to, I'm not going to put it on, I promise. Um, <laughs> When I look at Fred's life, I met Fred somewhere either 79 or 80 when I first moved to town as a youth pastor. One of the things that I immediately realized is that Fred had a great influence and voice in our city. He had great integrity. He would speak up when something was wrong because you do realize he did have a very strong opinion about everything. <laughs> and one of the things that he, when I, the first time I asked him to come preach at our church, he goes, you don't want me. He didn't say, he might have said, good, good night. You don't want me. <laughs> you want my wife. I said, what do you mean? He said, have you ever heard Carol preach? I said, well, I've heard about Carol. He said, don't. Don't, I will waste your time. Have her come over and preach. And Carol, you did come and preach at our church. And I don't think Fred ever did. <laughs> Sorry, Fred. <laughs> um, but his, any of you remember there on Cedar Street? You remember the, the way the sanctuary was? In fact, let me do something really quick. How many of you were there the first Sunday or the first year that uh, Fred and Carol move to Las Vegas. Can I see your hand? Let, let's see how far back you guys go. Wow, that is awesome. That was 1971. How many of you were there uh, when the school started? Anybody remember the school? Oh, look at all those hands. How many of you at Calvary Foursquare got saved there? I'm going to add something to it. Keep your hand up. Or someone in your family. Wow, that's awesome. One of the things that having Fred speak into my life for many, many years is that he loved the study that was right next to behind the pulpit. And I actually was kind of a little bit envious when I first saw his library, all these books, and you know, he just, he, that was his place that he got alone with the Lord. And so in honor of him, one of the things he would always tell me that when you preach, make sure you are anchored or grounded in God's word. They don't really care about your opinion. 
They want to know what God's Word says. And so I want to read, I think, a very appropriate passage this afternoon, written by the Apostle Paul to his young protege. Now, I'm not so young anymore, but when I first met Fred, I was 27 years old. And Fred had an amazing ability because when you're young and you pastor, you have lots of doubts about your self-worth and your abilities and there's older people and, and how are you going to get them to respect you and, and, and so on. And so not only did Fred listen to me, Fred did something that I don't think but maybe three other pastors have ever done in my life. He believed in me. He believed in me when I did not believe in me. He believed in me when my wife at times was saying, don't give up, and, and uh, no, let's just give, and, and Fred was there to say, no, not only will you get over it or through it, but when you look back at it, you'll understand what God was doing. He said, Greg, you are a wonderful young preacher. You have a heart for people. And he said, I will say, don't ever lose your heart. I hope your skin gets a little bit tougher. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll read quickly. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. And how many of you know he is in the presence of Jesus Christ? And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Could we address this to each one of us here today? Because every one of us are not just necessarily by title a pastor, but we are a shepherd. We are a shepherd to you moms, the young moms. You are a shepherd to that little flock at home. If you work, you are a shepherd to the flock of those that are under your leadership. If you, in any form of ministry, you are a shepherd. You may have a flock of five. You may have a flock of 500. But the Apostle Paul said, in the presence of God, I give you this charge. And it's not as if there's one person that's ranked over the other, but in fact, this is to the priesthood of all believers, every one of us who are called as a follower of Jesus Christ. Preach the word. I think uh, Carol understands that with, Amy Simp with Sister Amy Simple McPherson. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now listen to, to verse 3. My gosh, it's like this is unfolding. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers and their itching ears want to hear they'll turn their eyes away from the truth and turn to myths but you keep your head in all situations endure hardship do the work of an evangelist discharge the duties of your ministry for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near and I want you to just hear Fred Dawson saying this I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, our righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. Paul gave Timothy a charge. And in the midst of that charge, it came with responsibilities to 
And if I were to, to quickly go back and look at the specific things that he mentions here, there's a, a wonderful sermon outline. And I don't know how to do this because I've got snot running down from my nose. Yes. Those, th by the way, snot is in the Bible. What verse is that? Uh, I know it's snot right, whatever it is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and do this. Because once again, I want to leave an impression on you the way I think Fred has left an impression on me. But I want you to recognize he's done the same for all of us. I don't know if this will work, and I apologize beforehand. Uh, Josh, since you're such a good sport, will you come help me real quick? I'm, I'm not going to make a pie and throw it, I promise. Um, kind of take that and, and pour it over my hand just a little bit, just to try and get it all wet. Okay, now, I'm going to put my hand right here, and I hope this works. Okay, uh, I apologize. Is Diego, is he here, your drummer? Musicians are really finicky about their instruments. <laughs> here you go. I'm going to try and do something that people who have plexiglass hate this. Okay, that is perfect. I'm going to have you leave that up here because we're going to do that again. I don't know how I'm going to turn my pages, but we're going to do that again. How many of you know what that is? That, my friends, is a handprint. A handprint that when I was watching my grandkids this last week, and whenever you preach for someone that you look up to, and you give a memorial service for, it's such an honor that you keep going through the message in your mind. And I've already preached Fred's sermon at least 20 different ways. But all of a sudden, I watched one of my kids, and we have not, not, nine or ten grandkids. I can't even remember. We've got one more in the hopper. Um, we have, of all things, my wife decided she wanted to go with all the new furniture. And so we have tile floors for six kids under six years old. That is a really smart move on our part, isn't it? They fall down, bam. They, they don't just, you know, get a bump on their head. It's stitches. She decided to get glass on all the furniture, like this part glass and part something and they've already broken the the credenza that has you know and i oh anyway doesn't bother me at all <laughs> and as she did that she got a glass coffee table how many of you know toddlers they love coffee tables and let me tell you glass coffee tables no i'm not even going to tell you but the one thing that i see all the time are these little handprints that are everywhere. Everywhere. And I mean, I walk around with a rag and with Windex, and I still can't stay up with it. It reminded me many, many years ago when my own kids, and when all of a sudden they had grown up, and I looked and I saw where they used to hit a window, and, and I actually saw a handprint of one that was really small that that window had never been washed. And I looked at that, and I go, boy, I wish I could see some more handprints. Those were very, very special days. So I want to talk to you about the handprints that Fred Dawson left on my life and challenge you to think in terms of what are the handprints that he left in your life. And I'm going to be very brief. 1978, we had the first Billy Graham crusade. I met Fred somewhere around that time or after that. Uh, in 1981, Fred wanted to, or uh, Billy wanted to come back and do another 
uh, crusade here. And so the first handprint I want to talk about is that I realized, I discovered, when Fred was at a meeting with 30 other ministers from the valley at a restaurant called Alias Smith & Jones. And we're all gathered around, and we're up there eating, and we're talking about everybody's excited, the unity that will bring to the town. Fred, because he was really old at that time, um, or so I thought, he was kind of the, the senior guy, so he kind of was a spokesman, and he said, isn't this great? And, you know, we get everybody together like this, and, 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 and one of the guys chips in, yeah, you know, it'd been great, you know, if we could just do this afterwards as well, you know, the, the sense of being ecumenical with each other, the body of Christ. And right in the middle of all of that, um, one of the guys chipped in, and he just out of the clear blue goes, well... We're not sure our church or our ministry is going to be involved. We kind of looked at him like, I mean, come on, who doesn't get involved with Billy Graham? I mean, that's, you know. And it almost was like, you know, we lead hundreds of people to the Lord every year, and our ministry, thank you, you're a sweetheart. Our ministry, we, we don't really have time for you all. And we go, okay, that was kind of a cheap shot, but I'm young. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe I misheard it. And, you know, and so it was kind of an attitude. You ever get around somebody who's a Christian has just kind of an attitude that's just like really like, are you kidding me? Oh, yes, we're so happy that you're here. Yes, God bless you. We have a seat right here for you. They literally had that kind of attitude. And what happened was in the middle of all of that, they actually said, well, we don't know if we're coming to the next meeting, but we, you know, and they, they said it. We don't need you guys. We can do it on our own. Well, that's biblical, isn't it? You know, bear just your own burdens, nobody else's. Fellowship of believers. I mean, come on. And, and Fred, oh, my gosh. This is the first time I ever saw what I would later call the Fred face. <laughs> now, this is a very distinct face. And perhaps because I share with you one of his attributes, I watched Fred for the first time because I had him on a pedestal. I mean, the guy could do no wrong, you know, in my eyes. He started squirming in his chair, shifting his weight, his hands were on the table. I thought he was going to start pounding it. He kind of arched his back. His head started rocking. And as his head started to rock, I knew he wanted to say something, but he was biting his tongue. And then, of all things, you could just kind of see his nostrils flare. <laughs> now, that's, that's a big view. And I knew he was mad, he wanted to say something, but I also knew Fred enough to know that just because he gets angry doesn't mean he's going to immediately jump in there. But he did. <laughs> and he said, well, frankly, frankly, uh, you know, you really have, I guess in today's language, they said, yeah, well, yeah, you're putting out that vibe. <laughs> yeah, you've made it real clear you don't want us. Yeah, we heard that. You know, and Fred had some good words to say for him. And, and, and I'm sitting there, you know, a little, here's Fred, probably 50 years old, and I'm a little 25-year-old guy going, hit him again, Fred, get him again. Get that, get that, all that pride out of them. Hit him again. And uh, the first handprint Fred put on my life was the handprint that there are times when we have to speak up when something's not right. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give him this. He did gather his thoughts. He didn't say it immediately because he knew he was going to say something he would later regret. That was the first handprint. I'm going to try this one more time. I don't know if I've got a bunch of them in me, but let's just really make your, um, make your drummer really mad tomorrow or whenever it is here. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, here's another handprint. 
1981. How many of you remember the MGM fire? Everybody, yeah. Um, it was the same week that the Billy Graham guys were coming to town, which Fred was right in, in the midst of organizing all that flip. And immediately, I found out later that immediately when there was smoke, Fred was on his way to the MGM. Now, the reason I know that is that several days later, I was trying to talk with him about, well, Fred, you know, did you guys lose anybody? Did anybody get injured at, at, at your church and this and that? And all of a sudden, he went through this whole protocol of everything that he had done. And one of the things that you realize with Fred is that his integrity and his protocol of life and ministry was woven into the fabric of his character. In other words, that's who he is and was. And so immediately there was a community need and Fred went, when there was smoke, he went right to the fire. And I thought about that, that here's the difference between a pastor who was 50 and one that was 26, 27. I never even thought about it. You see, I was a pastor at the time of a church called Christian Life, and my parameter of the church is I'm the shepherd over this nice little flock we call whatever your church name is. And I never really thought about it until, you know, you begin to study and realize that the church, Ecclesia, is not a building, it's not a place, it is a group of believers of a city or an area or a nation. And I realized that he wasn't just a pastor to Calvary Foursquare. He was a pastor to the community of Las Vegas. And you know that that act alone of what he taught me, that handprint has stayed with me forever because it makes me realize that the whole community it's not defined by dominant denominational doctrine. It's not defined by where our church location is or this church is too close to that or what you uh, preach. We are the body of Christ. And when we're called to minister, we're called to an area, to a city, to a place. And Fred taught me that. You can go ahead and sit down. My, my hand is already, it's, it's drying up on this rag, and I don't think I'll be able to separate it. <laughs> How many of you know Fred had strong opinions? <laughs> Relatively quiet in here. His greatest opinion when he was around Carol? Yes, dear. He was a smart man. By the way, might I say this, that do you know that uh, your husband and some of the men that he graduated with, you guys had a stellar, didn't Dr. Risser go graduate with your group? And, but you know that there was a theology or a doctrine that was d established when he married you, as well as some of those other pastors who on do great things. As a four-square minister, it was written into the bylaws, you have to marry up. Now, let me tell you, he didn't just, he, he hit the mother load with that lady. That's all I got to say. I want to tell you, and I, and I heard some reference to this about how competitive he is. Now, getting to know him in ministry, you know, running into the fire, and he's, he's, you know, I'm loving this guy. And, uh, and I keep asking him questions all the time whenever we had a pastor's lunch. And so, uh, Ron, um, Merrily, your 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 bless Ron. He's probably having a good time and telling stories with his father-in-law, but your husband Ron back in the day, good night. Competitive doesn't even describe who he was. <laughs> and and I'm telling you what. Every time it seemed like we played in the church volleyball league, I think it opened what about '89 or something like that. And we had all these churches playing each other. I'm going to tell you what, those were, those were some games. Now, I'm a very competitive person. My wife is Irish, and her last name's McCoy, and as in McCoy's in Hatfields, and don't ask her who won because the back, it doesn't matter. It's a McCoy, so <laughs> the argument over. 
and, and, and she loved it, and she was competitive. And so I got her sisters, got four Irish women on our team. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're, we're playing Calvary. You, Marilee, you were on that team, I think, maybe. I know Sherry wasn't. <laughs> She's going to kill me. Um, You know how you rotate around in volleyball and you look at the person you're coming up against and like, no offense, if I was going to stand over you, Mary, like, oh, good, I got a girl in front of me. I'm going to spike it, you know. So it comes around, I make it over here, and here's across from me is guess who? Fred Dawson. 50-some-year-old Fred Dawson now. And uh, maybe even closer to 60. And I'm looking at him, and I thought, and, you know, I had fun. Oh, man, you're going down. <laughs> you know, and I'm having fun. And, and he, he did, he could, maybe he did trash talk, but he didn't around me. <laughs> and I think I infuriated him so much, he just goes, you know what, buddy? It's going to be good night to you. <laughs> True story. I'm looking at him, and all of a sudden, they're setting him up for a spike. And I go, oh, my gosh, I am going to stuff this back in his face. You think his nose is big now. Wait till you see it when I get done with it. So I go straight up, and, and uh, he was going to spike. It was a nice set. I go straight up with my hands up, and you know what that turkey did? Not only did he spike it unmercifully, he spiked it so hard it didn't hit me in my arms or hands. It hit me in my face. And I went down. And my nose started to bleed. And I thought, is this any way for a man of God to act? Now, I don't know. I was kind of dizzy, and I'm not sure if he said this, but I thought I heard him say, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. I, I, I don't know for sure if that was it. You know what I learned on that handprint? Pastors and ministry leaders, they're real people. And they can be competitive. They can say the wrong words sometimes. But that just made me love him that much more. And I came up and I told him a couple weeks later after my pride was recovered. I said, Fred, I, man, you, you are something else. Man, I had no idea that you got, could ever get that lucky and hit the ball like that. <laughs> That's my third handprint. The next one was an amazing lesson that I never really understood till about 20 years later. Do you ever have lessons like that? Something happens, but you don't really get it until later on down the road. Um... In 1984, 85, we, I was pastoring a church that, that we had started called Christian Life Community. And I was still going to pastor's things with, with Fred probably at least once a month. And he took me aside one time. He said, Greg, you know, I know that you guys, and we had grown amazingly. I think in, by the time 1987, Easter, where there was about 2,200 people that were at the Hacienda Hotel that year. So the church had just taken off. We didn't know what the heck happened. Um, I, I, we, we even went to Fuller Seminary to find out why do churches grow. We didn't go there to see how to grow. And we said, what heck, what happened? And, and so Fred, and I don't know if Fred, did Fred, any of you, you don't have to raise your hand, did he ever take you aside? Maybe some of you men. And maybe talk to you about the way that you're talking to your wife or maybe pointing something out in your life that maybe you don't really want to hear, but he loves you enough to say it. Well, he took me aside and he said, Greg, I, I want to just tell you something. He said, I love you, but here's what I worry about with you. And uh, I said, well, what is it? You are one of the most sharing people I've ever seen when it comes to ministry. You don't take credit for anything. And he said, if you're not careful, and then he gave me a whole Bible lesson on the anointing of God. And basically, in that I said, you know, Greg, a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist, the anointing of God 
is given on an individual basis. He doesn't give it to 20 people at the same time in the same position. He gives it to one person who's called to lead, to lead people out of Egypt, to lead a tribe, to be a king, whatever it may be. He said, the anointing is resident in you. And if you're not careful, you're going to let... You're going to give it away to everybody else and what they're, they're going to think down the road that they did all of this and then all of a sudden they're going to toss you out. Young guy. Oh, Fred, they're not like that. They're not like that. Two or three years later, that's exactly what happened. Now, The handprint in my life was that he had the confidence to graciously speak the Holy Spirit into my life. Sometimes we hear it, sometimes we don't. Do you have that same ability in your life? Will you say the tough things to people that you love? Will you say things they may not agree with, but you know need to be said? 1987, when all of this happened, was probably the worst time of my life and my family, but now I look back, it was one of the best times. Right in the middle of all this, uh, I was no longer the pastor there. I was moving to Texas in my mind. And uh, Fred called me up one day. He said, hey, can, uh, can I take you to breakfast? And we went to breakfast. And then he did it again. And this time my dad was in town, and he went with my dad. And then about two weeks later, he said, you know, I want you to come with me. And I said, well, where are we going? So we're going to, I don't want to tell you, but it's going to take most of the day, maybe even the night. So I said, okay. He came in, and, and what was that big, long, white car you guys had? Was that a Lincoln or 98, the old one? Oh, that, that thing was like, it was a boat. And... Um, he picked me up, and we got on the road, and of course, on the, you know, Italians are a little bit directionally challenged, but I knew we were going to Southern California, and um, kept going, kept going, and finally, you know, I knew kind of the, where we were going, and we're in San Bernardino, and all of a sudden, he heads up the mountain, we were going to Camp Cedarcrest, and he pulls into one of the cabins, and takes me inside, and there were a couple gentlemen inside I'd never met before. One of them was named John Watson, who was our supervisor at the time. And there's another guy, just a, God, what was his name? Dr. John Holland, I think, or something like that, who maybe, I think he might have been the president of the Foursquare at that time, something like that. And I want to clarify something. Fred, was there ever a moment in my life that I ever feel like he was quote wanting to recruit me or to get our church to come into the four scar because that's one of the first things people always ask about motivation and people at our church are well they're just doing that because they want you in their group I said no you, you don't understand do you know for the next four and a half hours I poured out my heart to a depth that I'd never, ever poured it out before, even with my own father. And as I sat there sharing the heartbreak and pain that I was going through, all I could think of was Jesus and a couple of his disciples who were there just trying to love me back to life. And what I, handprint that he left on me is he really cares. It wasn't for show. It wasn't because he's a pastor. He was a genuine lover of Christ. And when you love Christ, your highs are higher, your lows are lower, your joys are greater, and your, your, your hurts are deeper. And man, they were just like sweet, savory, medicinal aloe on the wounds of my heart. And so... I was licensed at your guys' church in 1989 at Calvary Foursquare. 
Next thing, a couple more handprints. Or Sherry will put a handprint on me. <laughs> Next handprint's given in John 10, chapter 14. I know my sheep, and my sheep know my voice. Fred loved people. He loved his sheep. And the reason I know that is because there's a connection here that I don't know if you've ever been a baseball player or maybe you're a card player or whatever it is that when you connect with somebody of a similar gifting or talent or, you know, priorities, you connect at the heart. And one of the things I know why Fred was a pastor is because he loved people. He loved them. Good, bad, the ones that hurt you, the ones that don't, the ones that need to be forgiven, the ones he, he asked to forgive him. But he also was a realist. Fred realized that pastoring and ministry are a lot like baseball. And Bart Giamatti said that Baseball is designed to break your heart. Ministry is too. And being a Christian is. There's a breaking involved in our lives every day. We are breaking to our own will and submitting to God. Unless we deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily and follow Him. We're called daily. When Jesus shared the communion loaf, break this bread, my body broken for you. Do we somehow think that we're going to do any less than what Jesus did? And although he was the epitome of John chapter 10, that the shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep, I learned something from Fred. People that you love will hurt you. People that you love deeply will hurt you. 2 Timothy 4.16, Paul said that in my first offense, no one came to my support. How's that? You went to the prison and nobody came to see him. All those churches that he had started and letters he had written, not one person came to see him. Everyone deserted me. Hmm, kind of sounds like somebody on the cross, doesn't it? Where were the disciples? Oh, yeah, they were you know, in the suburbs behind a door with the curtains drawn because they were afraid. Everyone has deserted me. But listen to this attitude. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood by my side, and he gave me strength. And that's what I love about Fred, what I loved about his leadership. People hurt us. But he not only got up, he knew it's going to happen again. And if you go on and read 2 Timothy 4, he names the guys that really disappointed him. He said, that's okay. I forgive them. Might I say this about Fred Dawson? Fred cared and loved people way more then they loved him back. He loved people more than they loved him back. I don't say that as a fault. I don't say that as a criticism on anybody. But that's a shepherd's heart. That's a shepherd who will go and leave the 99 and go to the one that's lost, will go to the hospital, will do the things that Fred did year in, year out, praying trying to come up with a Bible message, trying to feel all of the things that pastors and ministry takes us through in the body of Christ. Fred never stopped loving me. And he loved me real hard. Next handprint, I got two more, Sherry, then we'll get out of here, okay? The handprint of going to Hong Kong. He's, how old was 60? When, when he went 60? Gone to Hong Kong to be a missionary when you're 60. Except when you look at it, Moses 
led some people out of Israel at 80. Abram, oh, wait a minute. Abram tried to thwart God's plan and tried to do it at 75 because that's getting old. Had to wait till he was 99 till his son was born. Moses or uh, Noah. How, many, how old was he when I think when he started? Uh, didn't he do that like for like 120 years or something? Just about how long this sermon feels. You know, you know what the handprint was? The handprint that he left on my life. You're never too old to go. It's never too late to minister. I don't care what you did back here. This is what i am got to do now. You're never too old to serve the Lord. And so I learned when the gospel says, go into all the world, Fred and Carol Dawson, thank you for doing that. The last one that I wrote down was in 2001, and someone made reference to it. And it had to do specifically uh, when I became a supervisor. We kind of rearranged the Foursquare uh, administration, and uh, what happened was for we went to much smaller districts. I was a supervisor over about 35 churches. And one of the things, though, is I couldn't go around like a typical supervisor and go and preach every Sunday at all the different churches because I still was pastoring a church, and I loved my church and didn't want, you know, it wasn't time. And so what happened was I realized that our pastors still need that contact and that care that's given to them on Sundays. There's, guys, I don't know what there is about every other day of the week, but I know that's the day Jesus rose from the dead, and I got to tell you, it is good to be on May 1st back in the house of the Lord, amen, that we can, we can come together, assemble together. You can, I can Zoom pray and Zoom worship all I want, but, you know, those people are about that big on that Zoom call. You guys are real-life people. And, and there's a strength because the Bible says man is not meant to live alone. You know, he, he's meant for companionship. And sometimes as pastors, we do an injustice to some scriptures, and particularly that one we use only for marriage. When God said it's not good for man to be alone, he, he made us to have fellowship with him. And so when we start having fellowship again and, and, and so on, I realized that he needed, that the pastors, and I'm going to have a couple of them here, Doug Linderman, you were pastoring at that time, and, and Pete Akins, who planted our Cedar City uh, church, was the first one we sent out. Was that 01 or 02? And I realized that we got to touch base with these guys. So I had a crazy idea. And they gave us a little budget, not a lot, a couple thousand a month, you know, for the district office. And I, I approached Fred and Carol, and I said, what would you think about being, like, I don't even know. They don't have a title for it. We can make one up if we want. But, like, you be the, the associate, assistant, co supervisor, whatever title we want to use, but will you go as my representative and will you go every Sunday to the churches around the valley, Pahrump, Cedar City, a couple of them down in Arizona, and would you do that? And I said, now, I, 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 I and I found out that they, that they weren't getting much of a retirement and all that because pastors are terrible about that. Um, but I said, I, I, could, I, I can't give you that much money, but I could give you something. And so we gave them $500 a month. And, and that's, the money is not the important thing, except that it's an expression that you believe in somebody. But I said, with, here, here is your admonition. Go every Sunday. You can, you can take vacation, too. But I want you to go and take the pastor and his wife or kids. I want you to go love on. That's all I want you to do. Go be with them. Sit in church. If they want you to preach, great. If they don't, just love on them. And then take them to lunch after Sunday service is over and pick up the tab for them. That's all they did. They did it for six years. At a time in their life where I know, because I'm right getting close to that age, when you don't really feel like you got much worth left. And somebody came along and said, you know what? Why are you guys sitting on the sidelines? 
You got too much under the, under the hood of that car, under, in that engine. You guys need it. And so, I don't know. I never tried it before. I didn't know if the four square tried so I just did it. And it worked. Oh, my gosh. I look like one of the smartest pastors in the whole world. <laughs> and what even was better was the budget part of it. Because I'd ask them, take them to lunch, and I'll pay for your gas, and turn in the receipts, and then the stipend. Now, you know Fred. He is a pretty exotic guy. He was, he was pretty overboard in the clothes. I mean, he was a clothes hound. He had some really great missionary shirts that probably got three for $25 when he was in <laughs> Thailand. And I'm not saying he couldn't dress, but he couldn't. Um, <laughs> And you also know that he liked to wine and dine Carol, right? You know. Um, when he go to Pahrump, there's not a lot of choices to go to lunch there. Now, you can go to the hotel and some of them and, and the buffet, but, you know. You know what, Fred, mostly, most of his, if you were to measure all his receipts, you know where the number one place is he took everybody? True story. McDonald's <laughs> because he didn't want to burden the budget is that Fred Dawson or what and then when he tell me that's a Fred at least did you get a Big Mac <laughs> well no I got a cheeseburger or you know something small on the value menu when I look at that I realize something that had transpired He had passed the baton of believing in me many, many years previous to that. And now I had a chance in the relay race of life to pass the baton back to him. And saying, Fred, Carol, you guys are going to kill it. And now I believed in them. When they had a whole group of people around them through the years, that they may have felt or for whatever reason sometimes we get so busy when you get older we don't think to ask certain whatever but I realized I was giving back to them what they had given to me many years ago and Fred Dawson no matter what I did things bad good made a bad joke about snot whatever Fred you know he had decorum I didn't but I gotta tell you he believed in me. If I were to ask you right now, what's the handprint that Fred Dawson left on your life? We could go for two more hours of just sharing those gifts. Maybe it was, he taught you something in the Word. Maybe he modeled how to love your wife, how to not give up. Whatever it may be, he, his handprint and Carol's handprint is all over our lives. And we need to see that and rejoice in that and celebrate that. But not only celebrate it, realize that we have hands. And we have people and friends and family and co-workers and people that we go to school with and people that we do life together in church and we can leave a handprint of the love of Christ on them. The way that Fred Dawson left his handprint on my life. I'll close with this thought. When he went up to Pete's church, when he first started, Pete, what was the phrase he said to you? He said, love or live. If you will practice what you preach to this young preacher up there in Mormon land whose church is doing wonderfully well. He said, if you will practice what you preach, then when you get older, 
you'll preach what you've been practicing. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord, shall we? I know that Psalms 1 was one of Fred's favorite, favorite psalms. And I couldn't help but think that knowing all the things that Fred was capable of, I've, I've seen him in so many hats through his life of everything from a volleyball player to uh, somebody turning burgers to somebody who's working on a, got a hammer and a, and a tool belt around him doing work in what, wherever it was to help on missions programs. And I want to declare this over his family. And, and might I say just to the three grandkids, I got so tired of hearing about you guys. <laughs> and Lindsay, I know we're praying, but girl, he didn't know anything about diving. But he sure loved you. And I'd ask him what a, you know, and he'd go, huh? I don't know, but boy, she does it good. <laughs> Let's listen to the word of Fred as he, just a week ago today, went to be before his father. As the word declares, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And so I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. And of course, that was Thomas. How, Lord, we don't, how do we know? How do we get there? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Father, we thank you that Fred is already sprucing up his mansion getting ready to receive some of the great saints that he's partnered with and his incredible wife and family and Lord as we think in terms of realizing that a thousand years is as a day to you that it will be any moment and we'll be in the presence of the Lord thank you Lord for the handprint that Fred left on our life Calvary Foursquare Solid Rock, Northgate, whatever name it will be after that. He left his handprint. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, would you just do one thing right now where you're sitting? And if you're not comfortable with it, that's fine. But would you just take your hands right now and just hold them before you? You don't have to. If you're not comfortable, that's fine. Father, you see these hands right here? These are the best hands we have. They're the only hands we have. And sometimes we lift up, and sometimes we push down. Sometimes we move forward, and sometimes we hold back. Sometimes we lift our hands in worship, and other times we lift our hands in cursing on the driver as we go down the freeway. But Lord, these hands are your hands. These are your hands that you've given to this city to spread and propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. May they be hands that encourage. May they be hands that help carry burdens. May they be hands that lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. May they be hands that help move obstacles out of the way. And may they be hands that worship and praise our Lord and Savior. Lord, let us realize these aren't just anybody's hands. These are your hands that are working through us. 
the same power that worked through Fred Dawson. May these hands that we now cup before us, may these hands be commissioned to leave a handprint on that cantankerous neighbor, upon that one teacher your kid can't stand, against that one bully at church, against that one political issue that you're just driving you nuts. May these hands be your hands. May we never forget their nail-scarred hands because of what you did for us. Father, we thank you for Fred. We thank you for his family. We thank you. So often the word legacy is tossed around. Lord, it is so appropriate in his life. Thank you for Fred, John Deere, International Harvester Dawson and I can't wait to see that brother because I'm going to spike him with one of those big pearls in heaven Amen Well thank you for leaving your imprint on us today Greg Diego's not going to be happy when matter of fact I've got some kids that are going to come tag your church after (laughs) you've already got them (laughs) well what a wonderful day this has been wonderful afternoon thank you for those very very encouraging words Um, we have some fellowship that's going to take place on the other side of this wall here there's lots of food There's tables set up. Uh, Please enjoy the food, enjoy the fellowship. Uh, Just before uh, I have you stand, and I'm going to ask the family if if they would go first. You can have your time with them on the other side of this wall. Um, Twelve years ago, I came to this city. Was not sure I even liked Las Vegas. As a matter of fact, I knew I didn't. But my wife says, God said we're supposed to go, we're going. And so we came. On the way here, on, the, on, on 15 Freeway coming north, uh, I had this urge to call Fred. And uh, I called him and said, I'm coming. He said, I know that. And I said, uh, I, I, I wonder if I could spend some time with you. I mean, you pastored this church for 21 years. I know the name has changed a couple different times here. But uh, I I really would love to spend some time with you. He started crying. And he said, I don't get that very much from people who'd pastor here before. (laughs) He he says, uh, I would love to. This was on a Saturday. On Tuesday, he picked me up at my house in that big 98 Oldsmobile. What a comfortable ride, (laughs) you know. We spent the entire day driving around the city of Las Vegas and North Las Vegas. He showed me where the church first started. Talked to me about Ralph Barber and those who came after him. And uh, enjoyed, I enjoyed every moment of that. We took me to, took me to breakfast. He took me to lunch. I thought we were going to go for dinner, you know. <laughs> But he showed me he showed me the entire city. You know what he you know the imprint he put on my life? I started getting a love for Las Vegas. I knew we were supposed to be here, but I really knew it now because of the touch of Fred Dawson. And so uh, I'm I'm so very, very grateful. Stand with me, would you? Psalms thirty four eighteen says that God is close to the brokenhearted. And he comforts those whose spirits are crushed. I'm not necessarily sensing that today. We're here. This has been a time of celebration. But family, I know it's going to get a little tough sometimes. Grandkids, Carol, 
the rest of you. But God is close to the brokenhearted. Amen? Father, thank you for this incredible time that we have had together to remember such a dear, dear friend, brother, pastor, and the imprint that he has put upon our lives has been immeasurable. And Lord, may we too, like we've been challenged today, to have our hands and our handprint on other lives. May we change our work and those who surround us, oh God. Thank you for a wonderful example of both Fred and Carol and the entire Dawson family, Lord. We thank you for their lives and what they've meant to us. I pray your continued blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you leave, let's let the family go first. Family, I'm going to have you go that way. And all of us are going to go through that door right there because the uh, tables that you're going to be going to are, if you go to that door, you're going to run into a, a, a lot of other people. So in just a moment, you haven't seen each other in a long time. Start talking to each other, huh? And God bless you. Thank you for being here. And family, if you'll if you go ahead and go out that door, out, out, the, out that way, okay? Give them just a few minutes, and God bless you. Thanks for coming.